Welcome to I Love to Tell the Story, a podcast on the narrative lectionary. I'm Rolf Jacobson. And I'm Catherine Schifferdecker. And this is the podcast for September 18th, 2022. This is the second Sunday of the narrative lectionary for, uh, for this year. And this Sunday, we're moving from the story of Noah uh, and the flood to uh, the story of Abraham. And of course, in the narrative lectionary, we always have uh, a story of, of Abraham. Uh, this is one of the key texts, uh, not just for the story of Abraham, but for the uh, the whole Old Testament. Um, so we're looking at Genesis 12, uh, verses 1 through 9. This is the call of Abraham. Uh, of course, here he's known as Abram. You know, uh, most people will know him as Abraham, so uh, I'll, I'll refer to him as such. Uh, we haven't met Abram uh, or Abraham uh, before this. He's been mentioned just uh, in a in a um, genealogy right at the end of chapter 11. Uh, there doesn't seem to be anything particularly special about this Abram. Uh, but then chapter 12 begins, now the Lord said to Abram, go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. I will make of you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and the one who curses you, I will curse. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Now, uh, I don't know about you, Rolf, but when I teach uh, the, the Pentateuch, uh, when I teach these uh, first five books of the, of the Old Testament, uh, I, I, I don't think it's possible to overemphasize how important this promise this, to Abraham is, this call to Abraham. It's this threefold uh, promise, one, is uh, that that Abraham will be, become a great nation, will be the father of a great nation. Uh, another is that he will be uh, given the land uh, that God calls him to. That uh, that promise comes uh, a, a little bit uh, further on, a few verses later in verse seven. Uh, and then the third promise is a, a blessing that that Abraham will be a blessing, that God will bless those who bless him and curse those who curse him. And and here's the key point for me, in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Uh, so when when my students, uh, my students often have trouble <laughs> with this idea of choosing, and they're not the only ones, even the, the rabbis wondered, well, why Abraham, right? He doesn't seem to have done anything particularly significant. And so they, they added stories to the biblical text about Abraham's uh, worth, right? That, that Abraham was an idol smasher, that he uh, rejected all the idols that his father made uh, and uh, and worshiped the one true God. But there's no hint of that in the biblical text. There's just this kind of what we might call the scandal of election, right? The scandal of God choosing one person or one family over another. Um, yeah, so thank you. I do emphasize that. Um, you can't overemphasize these three or four four, three and a half promises. I want to come back to what I think is a maybe another one in there. Okay. Um, I, I think I always emphasize that it's to both Abram and Sarai um, because there is, there is actually something about Sarah. I'm just going to call her that. Um, that's different. Uh, so maybe it's about Sarah and not about Abraham, but in chapter 11, you've got the all the families of the earth after the flood are scattered and they don't understand each other. And because their hearts are still, you know, uh, the human condition hasn't changed from the flood, as you noted last week, because their thoughts are all about evil and violence towards one another. God decides to do something about this, that God has separated humanity into many families or tribes. And God decides to pick one tribe, one nation to be the priestly nation to bless others. And Sarah is the first person in the Bible said to be barren, childless. Mm, right. True. So maybe that's why that not only do we have in the sin, the human condition of being scattered from each other and violent between each other, but within ourselves, sometimes there's brokenness. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, we die, people get cancer. In this case, Sarah had a she was childless. And so God makes this ridiculous promise, because they're already old, that they would have children, and especially Sarah would have children. And so 
God's degree of difficulty in choose, choosing a priestly nation. Uh, he chooses the one woman so far in the story that's said to be childless. I, I think that's pretty, to me, astonishing. Yeah, no, that's a that's a great point. Uh, um, yeah, it's hard to be the father of a great nation when you don't even have one child. Right? Yeah, <laughs> or and of the course, parents of a great nation. Yeah, yeah, it's a it's a kind of impossible promise. That's uh, as as the late great Frederick Buechner said. You know, it's it's comedy, like uh, and and we get that laughter, of course, later in the story when both Abraham and Sarah laugh when God promises that they will have a child in their old age, right? Uh, and then the child, of course, is named Isaac, Yitzhak, laughter. But yeah, it's uh, it's a, it's an incredible promise uh, and one that you wouldn't blame Abraham for laughing at right here at the beginning of the story, but instead he went, right? <laughs> Verse four, Abraham went as the Lord had told him, and Lot went with him. Abram was 75 years old uh, and he took his wife, Sarah, and his brother's son, Lot. So it, it's this, uh, uh, Abraham, of course, is known as the father of faith. Uh, I said you know, before that he doesn't show any particular uh, reason for God's choosing of him. But of course, later in the story, he does. He, he exhibits great faith and, and here is where that starts, right? He, uh, to, to, to get up and go uh, to a place he's never seen before, to leave his extended household, his father's household and his people, uh, which was you know, the social security net, uh, to leave all that and to go to a new place. It takes either um, you know, a foolishness or uh, a great deal of faith. Um, yeah, he, he's becoming the one thing you never wanted to be, a sojourner. Uh, a resident alien, some, that, that is someone who's separated from their land and their father's house. So he leaves his land and he leaves his kindred and his, his kinship group and Sarah too, and they go. And uh, so that, then just, just to come back to those promises. So descendants, the rest of Genesis especially is human beings are, in, are um, putting God's promises at risk yeah. throughout it, especially God's own people. But then um, God finds ways to keep these promises um, throughout the Pentateuch. Can we just talk about the great name? I've, I've, from time to time, I've said, there's a fourth promise in here. Uh, Old Testament scholars almost always only point to three. But God also promises that um, Abraham and Sarah would have a great name. And later on, uh, um, Moses has promised to have a great name. So I just, um, it's, it's not as important as the other three, but it crops up here and there. Well, how do you, uh, how do you interpret that? You meaning just that they will, they will be remembered. No yeah. yeah, yeah, I think so. Um, yeah. You know, that is, even when we talk about the Abrahamic faiths, you know, I mean, um, that uh, they are revered, Sarah and Abraham are revered as people of faith, but of course they're fully broken and human. They're always, they're, they're constantly themselves doing things that they, they themselves put God's promises at risk. Yeah. Walter yeah. Brueggemann especially emphasizes blessing as the most important of, the, of these promises, that the blessing and which child it flows through and then out to the world uh, that's in Genesis. Um, he argues that's really the most important of the promises. Yeah, I think I think I would agree with that. And I and it goes back to what I was saying before about the scandal of election, right? If we who are Americans, especially, don't like the thought of you know a favorite child or a favorite anything, right? We don't like the idea of favoritism for good reason. And yet, this is not just or this isn't really favoritism so much as you referred to uh, Abraham uh, and his descendants as a priestly nation or a priestly kingdom. And of course, we'll see that later in Exodus 19 more explicitly, but Abraham is chosen not for his own sake, yeah, not for his own, you know, actions or faith. He's chosen in order to be a blessing. Yeah. And that's what I, you know, I just think that 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 can't be said enough. I think that scandal of election is not necessarily that the the 
idea of being chosen is not necessarily a desirable thing, right? I mean, think about all the terrible things that happen to the chosen people. Um, there's this old joke, right? The, uh, I, I don't remember how it goes, but it's something like, you know, God, the Jews say, please choose someone else, right? If this is what it means to be chosen, uh, choose doesn't, someone else. Doesn't Fiddler in the Roof uh, start off with that yeah, way? Yeah, that's right. That's have right. you? Yeah. I, I think that's right. Um, the scandal of the New Testament is that Jesus is the infinite God incarnated in a finite human life and dies on the cross. That's the scandal in the New Testament. The scandal in the Old Testament is every bit as, um, this is uh, right, astonishing. And yeah. that is that God chose Abraham and Sarah and their descendants to bless the world. I do think that um, in an adult form, form, maybe outside of the sermon, people are gonna need to deal with the question then of how we regard our Jewish neighbors and yeah. the land. Israel, the nation of Israel today. Um, right. yeah. That might, some people might uh, want to bring that up. Yeah, yeah. And I think you're right. That's more the topic of an adult forum than the sermon. But it, it, it's, yeah, it's worth saying that the the nation state of Israel is not the same thing as biblical Israel. So, but I, I just wanted, I, I wanted to say one more thing uh, in addition to that idea of, of Abraham and Sarah as being a blessing, right? That the conduit of God's blessing. Uh, to the world, uh, not for their own sake, but for the sake of the world. The other thing, I, I just want to go back to something we said last week about the story of the flood, that, that God's promises bind God, that God's promises obligate, or uh, that, that God deliberately chooses uh, to limit God's self out of love for uh, God's people uh, and, and to fulfill God's promises. That's true here too, Yeah, maybe even more so, right? Because these promises that God makes to Abraham, uh, they bind God. <laughs> I think probably the classic example of this, of course, is the story of the golden calf, where Abraham uses these promises of God to uh, Moses. To, to save the people Israel uh, after those Moses. Saved the golden calf. Uh, Moses, Moses, sorry, Moses does that, yeah. Moses reminds God of God's promises and says, you know, you can't destroy this people you promised. So uh, this this is why I say you can't overemphasize the, the uh, importance of this text of Genesis 12 to the rest of the biblical story.